After the age of 40, everyone must take responsibility for their appearance. Story number one. There's a tale about a craftsman known for his exquisite carving skills. Many people sought him out for his sculptures. However, what made this craftsman unique was his preference for carving monsters. One day, looking in the mirror, the craftsman realized his appearance had become terribly unattractive. Upon closer inspection, he noticed it wasn't his complexion that had changed, but his entire face had become mean, evil, and bizarre. He then visited a temple and asked the head monk for help. The monk said he could cure the craftsman, but first, the craftsman must carve 100 statues of the goddess of mercy. As a result, the craftsman dedicated himself to studying the form, demeanor, and gestures of the goddess, even reaching a state of self-forgetfulness, becoming one with the character. Half a year later, after completing the compassionate and kind figures of the goddess of mercy, he rushed back to the temple to ask the monk to cure him. The monk, without rushing, brought out a mirror and with a smile said, Your ailment has already been cured. It was then the craftsman realized his appearance had become upright, dignified, and solemn. A psychologist once said that if a person doesn't smile for a long time, their muscles will weaken, and smiling occasionally might feel strange or even startling. If a person is enthusiastic, optimistic, and always smiling in old age, their facial expressions will also reflect kindness and benevolence. Conversely, if a person rarely smiles and is often gloomy, their facial expressions will become stiff over time, making their appearance less friendly or even frightening as they age. In the study of physiognomy, these instances are referred to as the heart creates the face, or the face is born from the heart, implying that a person's temperament, thoughts, actions, and words will manifest in their appearance and demeanor. Story number two. The author B. Schumann shared a story about her visit to a cosmetic surgeon. This surgeon always asked his clients one question before performing any surgery. If the client couldn't answer it correctly, he would politely decline to proceed with the surgery. Halfway through the story, the author curiously asked, What was the question? The surgeon replied, Imagine your heart as a valley and describe to me, what do you see in it? Some said their valley was filled with lush trees and babbling brooks. Others talked about the valley echoing with birdsong and teeming with vibrant wildlife. While some described the valley as being stormed by howling winds, almost like a hellish scene, B. Schumann was perplexed, failing to see the connection to cosmetic surgery. The surgeon calmly explained, The beauty achieved through cosmetic surgery isn't permanent. True, lasting beauty comes from within. Why do people seek cosmetic surgery? In the end, it's all about looking better. But no matter how appealing the exterior, a person's character is hard to change, and it's through life's ups and downs that one's true value is formed. Just like skinny jeans that look different on various individuals, revealing distinct features. It's often said that time is the most accurate measure of beauty. Sorrows and despondency can lead to wrinkles, while happiness and optimism light up your face. If you desire a radiant, kind-looking face, your heart must be bright. Over time, the effects of cosmetic surgery will fade, but only a pure heart can sustain external beauty for the long haul. Story number three. Audrey Hepburn is a symbol of timeless beauty spanning generations. American author and TV host Sam Levinson once wrote a short poem for her titled the secret of timeless beauty. To have beautiful lips, always speak kindly. To have lovely eyes, look for the good in others. To have a slim figure, share your food with those who are hungry. To have beautiful hair, let children run their fingers through it every day. To walk with poise, carry the luggage of knowledge. Above all, humans need to be mended, rejuvenated, redeemed, 
Never abandon anyone. Remember, if you need a helping hand, you'll find one at the end of your own arm. Audrey Hepburn once said, As you grow older, you will discover that you have two hands, one for helping yourself, the other for helping others. The beauty of a woman is not in the clothes she wears, the figure she carries, or the way she combs her hair. The beauty of a woman is seen in her eyes, for that is the doorway to her heart, the place where love resides. True beauty in a woman is reflected in her soul. It's the caring, love, and compassion she offers that makes her beauty grow with passing time. This poem can be seen as a portrait of Hepburn's life, but was she really beautiful? Even Hepburn herself felt her cheeks were too square and her nose too sharp. She thought her nostrils appeared too large when she looked up, so she often tilted her head down in photos. Her forehead hair was thin and needed thickening when styled. Her eyebrows were overly bushy. Her legs were not slender due to years of ballet. She was excessively thin, and her chest was not full. In her youth, Hepburn's beauty was admired for stemming from an independent character and progressive spirit, always striving for self-improvement. It was the beauty of a young girl emerging from the horrors of World War II. In her later years, her beauty came from kindness, generosity, and the love of a woman. Having experienced starvation during the World War II as a child, Hepburn devoted herself to public welfare activities in her final years. On her deathbed, when her eldest son Sean asked if she had any regrets, her response was, No, I have no regrets. I just don't understand why so many children have to suffer so much. Perhaps that's why Hepburn remains beautiful, a beauty not just undimmed but even more radiant with time, transcending time. Japanese author Soichi Otaku once said, A person's face is their autobiography. Your inner qualities and cultivation determine your external image and style. This is absolutely true. What you say and do in the first half of your life, the knowledge you acquire, and the experiences you go through all invisibly change your appearance in the second half of your life. If you treat others with resentment in the first half of your life, the second half will reward you with ugliness. However, if you maintain joy and compassion, then a comfortable life will surely be yours. No matter what, don't let your appearance after 40 become ugly. Story number four. Here's a tale about Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States. Once President Lincoln was interviewing a man in his 40s for a government job. Despite the man's talent, Lincoln decided not to hire him. A puzzled assistant asked the president why. Lincoln responded, I don't like his face. The assistant, confused, questioned, Is it their fault if someone is not born attractive? Lincoln replied, After the age of 40, everyone is responsible for their own face. Indeed, as people reach middle age, their appearance begins to reflect their character and values. Generally, those with a generous heart tend to have kind faces. If someone is gentle by nature, their appearance is likely to be softly pleasing and noble. On the other hand, those with a rough and rude character often look fierce. Individuals with petty minds usually have unattractive features with furrowed brows. Those who appear particularly youthful and beautiful are surely pure and good at heart. All this is the outcome of nurturing one's spirit and the way one's actions mirror on their face. Thus, a person's appearance can also indicate their future destiny. Ancient people believed that by observing someone's appearance, one could predict their fortune. However, a person's appearance is not fixed and can be gradually improved. Notably, true beauty comes from the charm that radiates from within. Any good fortune is the result of accumulating good deeds. Hence, beauty also stems from a good heart. 2. Six Timeless Tips for Ageless Beauty – Cultivating Inner and Outer Radiance 1. Smile often. 
It's said that a smile is the best way to bloom a beautiful flower on your face. There's an old saying, even the fiercest hand won't strike a smiling face. A smile always warms the heart, making others happy, friendly, and closer. But the most important thing is that smiling not only beautifies others, but also communicates in the most easily accepted way. Smiling brings joy and happiness to others, satisfying them spiritually. Having a smile on your face can convey goodwill to everyone. It's a cost-free way to create great value, making it the most magical and convenient beauty method. 2. Praise others more. Everyone likes to hear praise and encouragement, especially when it's timely. Scientists have experimented with water, showing its crystalline structure changes with external sounds. Dr. Masaru Emoto found that when he played Mozart and Beethoven, the water crystals formed beautiful patterns under a microscope. Speaking kindly leads to beautiful water crystals. In contrast, harsh words cause chaotic movement. Therefore, praising and encouraging others can uplift their spirits, reflecting positively on their appearance. Speaking good words benefits us the most, naturally enhancing our appearance. 3. Be more patient, less angry. People who are patient and rarely angry tend to look better. Buddhist scriptures say ugliness results from frequent anger and resentment. A gracious, radiant appearance and a soft body liked by others result from patience. 4. Always be grateful. Being thankful for everything, from flowers and grass to people and objects, naturally fosters positive feelings towards everything around. A heart filled with gratitude is like a flower that attracts others. If you're filled with inner fragrance, your outer appearance will also be beautiful and glowing. 5. The Power of Positive Thoughts A person's outer appearance is closely linked to their inner state. Good inner qualities reflect outward beauty. A psychologist once said, A person's life reflects their state of mind and so does their destiny. So, if you wish to be beautiful, start by treating the world with good intentions. You'll not only find everything around you beautiful, but your own appearance will also improve. 6. Associate more with people of good spirit. The old saying, you're known by the company you keep, means that being around good people, those with a beautiful spirit, will influence you to become like them. Beauty isn't just about outer looks, but more importantly, the beauty of the spirit. A person with a beautiful spirit will have a beautiful appearance, their actions will be beautiful, and they will carry a fortune of good karma. 3. Confucius's Approach to Judging Character 1. Evaluate how someone views benefit. Confucius said, A noble person focuses on virtue, a petty person focuses on gain. Everyone tends towards seeking benefit, but there are those who value virtue over personal gain. In modern society, pursuing personal interests is a freedom, but if someone disregards ethics for the sake of benefit, ignoring family bonds and everything else, then such people should be kept at a distance. Benefit has always been a sharp tool to test and understand a person's heart. A person who stands by principles and ethics in the face of gain, valuing relationships and the bigger picture, is truly worthy of friendship. To truly understand someone, first, learn to use the word benefit. 2. Observe how someone gets along with others. Confucius remarked, A noble person treats others impartially while a petty person forms cliques. Forming cliques usually means not aiming to do good, but rather to criticize, ostracize, and isolate those who offend them. Therefore, whether at work or in other organizations, a person who gets along well with everyone is likely to be straightforward, impartial, and just. To see through a person, the second thing is to observe how they get along with others. 3. Check if the person keeps their word. 
Confucius stated, If a man is not trustworthy, what can he accomplish? Just as a carriage without wheels cannot move. To judge if someone is trustworthy, you don't need tests or roundabout observations. Simply see if they keep their promises and are reliable in their dealings with others. A person of integrity will not easily betray a promise or discard their credibility, while someone without principles won't care about anything, always putting themselves first, carelessly speaking. Hence, their words often don't translate into action, failing to fulfill promises to others. Trustworthiness is the most basic virtue of a person. Those who don't keep their words should be avoided at all costs. 4. Look at how someone treats their family. When asked about filial piety, Confucius said, The hardest part about being good to one's parents is maintaining a cheerful attitude. Indeed, typically people are nice to outsiders and bring their frustrations home. This is a common human flaw, but a morally upright person even when dealing with their children or parents, can maintain a proper and gentle attitude. Hence, to improve one's virtue, it's not just about being patient and not quick-tempered with colleagues, subordinates, or friends. More importantly, one should also keep a graceful and calm attitude towards their loved ones. To truly understand someone, see how they treat their family members. 5. See how someone reacts after making a mistake. Confucius said, By observing a person's mistakes, you can know their true nature. Just as animals gather in packs, humans form groups, and the nature of their errors reflects their character. Normally, it's difficult to see a person's true nature, but when they make a mistake, analyzing these errors can reveal their true face. The unprincipled make mistakes because they lack standards. The deceitful fall due to their lies. The upright often face setbacks for resisting evil. Idealists stumble due to naivety. Mistakes are mirrors reflecting a person's character, revealing their true nature. Humans are complex creatures capable of calculation and pretense, not as straightforward as other species. Understanding a person is no simple task. However, everything leaves a trace. By grasping these five methods, you can identify individuals with whom you can form long-lasting connections in this vibrant, colorful world. 4. 10. People Reading Skills To truly understand someone, you must master the art of people reading through the details to see their true nature. However, mastering this art doesn't happen overnight. It requires a lot of experiences facing many people, immersing in various relationships, and navigating through life's challenges to accumulate wisdom. Like the following 10 people reading skills, how many do you know? 1. People who talk without thinking often end up offending others and breaking relationships without realizing it. Those who speak sweetly and make everyone feel comfortable show high emotional intelligence. But what they think might differ from what they say, so be cautious. 2. If someone talks very little and is hard to understand, what should you do? The easiest way is to give it time to see their true self. Another effective method is to bring up their interests and observe their reactions, but still, keep it balanced. 3. Being able to control emotions, regardless of the situation, indicates true wisdom for living in society. These individuals have strong hearts. They may not always make quick decisions, but are clear-headed enough to solve problems. They are worth befriending and not offending. 4. Regardless of how unfair or tough situations are, People who don't complain or play the victim, but rather work hard in silence, can achieve great things. Many who face minor setbacks and unfairness often blame circumstances, hence not achieving notable success in their lives. 5. People who brag, not about themselves, but about knowing successful or wealthy individuals, usually lack real ability. 
They have nothing to be proud of, so they borrow others' glory to shine a light on themselves and stand out. 6. Someone praising you in front of others can make you feel good, but beware their intentions might not be genuine. On the other hand, individuals who offer private feedback, avoiding embarrassment or criticism, and truly caring for your dignity are genuinely interested in your well-being. 7. When it comes to matters of interest, be wary of those who try to bond over gratitude and favors. These individuals often look out for themselves and could go to great lengths at others' expense. Conversely, those who are upfront about financial matters from the start are often more trustworthy, as their chance of betrayal is much lower. 8. Proud people, though not always likable, can be more reliable because their pride doesn't allow them to break promises. In their eyes, personal honor is more important than anything else. 9. To quickly understand someone, observe closely how they react during conflicts. Even those who usually hide their true selves well can reveal their nature during arguments, as controlling oneself becomes much harder. 10. People who don't interact much but become overly enthusiastic and flattering when they need a favor are likely to turn on you quickly after getting what they want. They value what they can exploit from you, not who you are as a person. Hey everyone, your comments truly matter offering insights and motivation to others and uplifting our creative team at Lighthouse of Wisdom Channel. Sharing your thoughts and experiences enriches our community. So let's get the conversation started below and help illuminate our path with your wisdom. Five, to understand people, look at these three points. To read others' minds, you need to know three techniques. These are crucial for mastery. By mastering them, you can easily recognize and understand what people are thinking. So, let us tell you a Buddhist story that will teach you how to read others' minds. In a small village, two brothers lived together. The elder brother was blind, so he mostly stayed at home while the younger brother was a farmer. However, their farm was often destroyed by various animals in the field. The younger brother was worried about this, but eventually came up with a solution. He thought, why not ask his blind brother to help scare away the animals in the field? He could sit in the field and shout if he heard any animal sounds protecting our crops. After thinking it over, the younger brother built a small hut in the field for his brother to sit in, explaining, brother, if you hear any animal sounds, just shout and they will run away, saving our crops. The elder brother agreed with the idea and started sitting in the field. Whenever he heard animal sounds, he would shout, scaring them away. Once, a deer ran through and broke the fence before running away. Right after, a king who was chasing the deer also arrived at the field. The king saw the blind brother and asked if he had seen the deer here. The blind brother replied, Your Majesty, I am blind. How could I see the deer? However, I can tell your majesty that the animal has left my field and is not worth chasing. You are wasting your time. The king was surprised by the blind brother's words and asked how he knew this. The king asked if the blind brother was lying since he claimed to be blind, but spoke about evaluating the deer's worth. The blind brother said, Your majesty, the animal you think is a deer is actually a pregnant doe. I have never heard of a king hunting a pregnant doe, so I said it's not worth your majesty's pursuit. You should not waste your time chasing it. The king was amazed to hear this, unable to understand how the blind man could know it was a pregnant doe. He wondered how a blind man could be sure that the deer he was chasing was pregnant and how he could confidently inform him of this information despite being blind. The king felt the need to verify this and ordered his general, I want the animal captured. I need to confirm if it's really a pregnant doe. The blind brother seemed very sure about this, and I need to investigate. Go and find out if it's pregnant. The king's order was carried out by the general. 
When he returned, he reported to the king that the blind brother was right, and the doe was indeed pregnant. The king was astounded and couldn't understand how the blind man knew about the doe's pregnancy. The king had many questions in his mind and decided to ask the blind brother to find out the truth. I may not know if you are truly blind, but I have come here to ask you something. Are you willing to answer my question accurately? The blind brother said, Your Majesty, you may ask me anything, and I will answer truthfully. The king said, You are a wise man and seem to know a lot. Today I have called you to find out if my wife is faithful to me. The blind brother replied, Your Majesty, what kind of question is this? Your marriage has lasted for many years and now you want to know such things. Why are these questions arising in your majesty's mind? However, the king insisted, You must answer this question. If you do not provide an answer, I will punish you with the death penalty. Hearing the king's threat, the blind brother said, Your majesty, if you want an answer to this question, you will have to do something for me. The king asked, Tell me, what do I need to do? The blind brother replied, To do this, your majesty will have to leave your wife alone with me in a room. Initially, the king was angry to hear this, but eventually agreed to the request and ordered his general to leave the blind brother and the queen alone in the room. At that moment, the blind brother expressed his desire to touch the queen. Hearing this, the queen became furious and started hitting the blind brother with her hands, feet, and all her strength. After that, the blind brother escaped and met with the king. The blind brother told the king, Your majesty, your wife is not faithful. The king was furious, drew his sword, and went to the queen. The king warned her that any deception would lead to the death penalty and asked if she was faithful. The queen replied, your majesty can kill me, but I am not faithful. The king was delighted that everything the blind brother said was true. Hearing this, the king immediately turned back and asked the blind brother how. He knew his wife was unfaithful. The blind brother replied, Your majesty, it was actually very simple. I told your wife that I wanted to touch her, and she became so angry that she started hitting me. When I said I wanted to touch her, she could have refused. But instead, she started hitting me, and in the process, she touched my entire body. Your Majesty, tell me, how can a woman like that be faithful? The king said, You are truly wise. All right, answer one more question accurately, and I will set you free. Tell me, am I truly the son of my father or someone else's? The blind brother replied, Your Majesty, why do you care about this question? No matter whose son you are, you are still the king of this country. Let go of this question. But the king insisted, No, no, I want to know the accurate answer to this question. Otherwise, it will always bother me. I want to know the truth. The blind brother responded, Your Majesty, I can tell you right now who your father is. But first, I want you to promise not to be angry with me. The king said, I promise I won't be angry. Then the blind brother told the king, Your majesty is indeed the son of your father, but you are also influenced by a stingy merchant. Hearing this, the king rushed to ask his mother, Mother, please tell me the truth. Am I the son of my father or someone else? If you don't tell the truth, I will end my life right here. The king's mother replied, My dear, you are truly the son of your father, but you are also influenced by a stingy merchant. Hearing this, the king felt happy and immediately returned to the blind brother. He asked how the blind brother knew that the shadow of a stingy merchant was present in him. The blind brother replied, Your majesty, you have asked me many questions, and I have provided accurate answers to all of them. If you were a different king, I would have received many rewards by now, but you have never given me a single penny. From this, I estimated that your majesty is very stingy. The king laughed and said, Whatever you ask for, I will fulfill. But tell me how you know what is right and what is wrong, how you can give such accurate answers. 
The blind brother replied, Your Majesty, I am blind from birth. If I had eyes, I could easily understand anyone's thoughts. The mind has its own language, and this language can be seen in a person's body actions, observing their eyes, lips, how they walk, and their activities, we can understand what is going on in their mind. Based on this, we can know anyone's thoughts, but since I am blind, I recognize through actions. If I want to know something, I have to assign a task to the person to see how they perform it, and from there, I can understand what is going on in their mind. The king asked, Does that mean I can also know the thoughts of others? The blind brother replied, Certainly, your majesty can also understand the thoughts of anyone. But first, your majesty needs to practice on yourself, that is, to calm the mind and bring the mind to the present. Therefore, today I will tell you three ways, and these three ways are very simple and easy. But first, your majesty must do one thing, that is, to focus the mind. When we focus the mind and integrate the mind into the present, we can understand the thoughts of others because they are thinking in the present and we also need to bring our mind to the present. If we are thinking about the past, how can we know what the next person is thinking in the present because we are immersed in the past? To know someone's thoughts, we first need to focus the mind and bring it to the present. Then the blind brother told the king, your Majesty, I will tell you three ways through which you can easily understand the thoughts of anyone. The blind brother continued, The first method is to pay attention to the eyes. The most important thing when we talk to someone is to look into their eyes, because the eyes don't speak but say a lot. If we learn to understand the signals in someone's eyes, we can know what is going on in their mind, what they are thinking, and what they are about to do. I don't have eyes, but I learned this skill from Gautama Buddha many years ago, who was once my teacher and guide. At that time, I had eyes and could understand people's thoughts just by looking into their eyes. The blind brother continued to explain, So, if your majesty also wants to know the thoughts of others, you should pay attention to their eyes like their gaze where they are looking. And if their eyes wander somewhere while you are talking to them, it means they are trying to escape the conversation, and they might be lying. If that person avoids direct eye contact, it means they are afraid that their lie might be exposed, and the truth will come out. However, if their eyes look at you without blinking, they are probably sincere and interested. They want to talk and share their thoughts with you. Observe how their eyebrows move. If their eyebrows lower while looking elsewhere, they might be deeply thinking or worried about something else. If their eyebrows lift and their eyes become larger, they might be surprised or curious about what you are saying. Also, see how their pupils dilate or contract. The pupil is the black part of the eye. If the pupil dilates, it means they like you or what you are saying, they are excited or happy. If the pupil contracts, it means they don't like you or what you are saying, they feel uncomfortable or angry. Also, look at the white or red part of their eyes. The white part of the eye is called the conjunctiva. If the conjunctiva is red, it means they are tired, stressed, or sick. They might not want to talk to you. I remember meeting a tired traveler once, and when we talked, his eyes constantly looked around and never directly at me. This showed that he was anxious and wanted to leave quickly. I thought he might be hiding a secret. Pay attention to their facial expressions. Sometimes a person exhibits different behaviors through their facial expressions. If you pay attention to the expressions on their face, you can easily understand if that person is frustrated, very sad, or extremely happy. You can also guess how they are feeling inside, and all of this can be determined through the expressions on their face. Finally, the blind brother told the king about the third method. Your Majesty, there is another language, that is, the language of gestures and body language. To understand the thoughts of a person, we need to understand their hand gestures and body language. When a person speaks, 
Your Majesty might have noticed they continuously move their hands and create gestures. Besides words, body language plays an important role in conveying what a person is thinking. Your Majesty, the body and hands can say a lot without words. It's like a secret way of communication where you can see what others want and feel just through the small actions they perform. Think about when someone taps their fingers quickly on a table surface while talking to you. When fingers create a rapid sound on a surface, they might be feeling bored, hurried, or wanting to end the conversation soon. When someone crosses their arms, they might not like you or what you're saying. They are hiding their thoughts, the way they hold their hands like a wall, protecting their thoughts and feelings from others. Observing this sign, your majesty can appear gentle and careful when talking to them, helping them feel comfortable and more open. When someone frequently touches their face while talking to you, it also helps you understand their thoughts. This often means they are anxious, thinking seriously, or have a big idea. These small gestures let you know what's going on in their mind and heart. If we pay attention to these three methods and understand them accurately, we can quickly know what's going on in someone's mind, how much they are paying attention to our words, and what's going on in their mind. However, first, your majesty needs to focus the mind and bring it to the present. Only then can your majesty pay attention to all these actions, understand them, and realize what's going on in that person's mind. Your majesty might have seen many saints and enlightened people, those who look at you with great calmness and can tell you what's going on in your mind and what you come to learn from them. The biggest reason for this is they have the ability to read and understand you because their mind is focused and peaceful, and that's why they can easily understand your thoughts. Remember, understanding others is not just based on observation skills, but also depends on how we bring our mind to the present and become sensitive to the nonverbal signals that others send us. By combining these three methods, paying attention to the eyes, facial expressions, and body language, we can expand our understanding of the world around us and enhance our communication skills. 6. The Life and Legacy of Yuan Shu San, Master of Destiny Fortune-telling and physiognomy, face reading, are fascinating practices, yet not everyone pays attention to them, especially young soldiers full of energy. However, the following story changed the perspectives of famous Chinese politicians Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek towards physiognomy. So, which fortune-teller made these two Chinese political figures take notice? It was Yuan Shusan, born in 1881 into a family of doctors and fortune-tellers with a scholarly tradition. From a young age, he moved to Zhenjiang with his father, practicing medicine and fortune-telling. He didn't pass the imperial examinations, but later studied at Peking University and then went to Japan for further education. Despite having the opportunity for a governmental career after returning to China, he chose not to pursue fame and wealth and continued his practice in his hometown. Fortune-telling for Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek. It's said that he once met Sun Yat-sen, telling him he had the noble appearance not of ordinary wealth but of eternal honor, one who disdains the throne and does not seek power. Despite his reputation, Yuan humbly regarded himself as ashamed of the praise from others, only possessing enough skill to support his family. In the 17th year of the Republic of China, the government tried to ban astrology, medicine, and fortune-telling, affecting many people's livelihoods. Yuan Xu San then wrote a book, The Investigation of Chinese and Western Physiognomy, arguing for the profession and its practitioners. This book was praised by the head of the administration, Tan Yankai, celebrated in astrological circles, and solidified Yuan's status in the field of astrology. Yuan once said, Three types of people seek astrologers, those who've suffered great setbacks, those obsessed with fame and wealth, and those at their wit's end.
Thus, one must observe their expressions to understand their circumstances. This shows Yuan's deep understanding of human emotions. By the 1930s, Yuan no longer practiced medicine, focusing solely on fortune-telling. His reputation quickly attracted many prominent clients. The first high-ranking government official he met was He Ying Kin, who, after consulting Yuan, was so impressed that he introduced Yuan to Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang, intrigued, visited Yuan and was appreciative of his candid advice. From then on, political figures and wealthy businessmen were proud to possess a fortune-telling booklet from Master Yuan. Engo Boy Fu, a warlord, although skilled in physiognomy himself, sent someone to consult Yuan. Convinced by the consultation, he sent an envoy with a large sum of money to invite Yuan out of retirement. Yuan's response was, I am honored by your appreciation and terrified by your anger. Yuan became the most trusted astrologer of Chiang Kai-shek, predicting the fate of Quach Kai and Ma Lian Luang. In 1938, after the fall of Nanjing, four members of the Nationalist Party, including the officer Quach Kai and his team, retreated to Shanghai following a defeat. The team leader, believing in fate and physiognomy, thought it necessary to consult the great master Yuan Shu San. Although Quach Ki was skeptical about fate, he was persuaded by others to go along. After examining the others, Yuan told Quach Ki, Mr. Kwok, being a military man, you will be promoted to Major General by age 40. However, you will face danger to your life after a defeat in a desert battle. Yet you will safely return to your unit and from then on enjoy a smooth and happy life. They successfully escaped Shanghai, and Quach Ki indeed rose to Major General at 40 and was stationed in the Yao district of Xinghe. In early 1945, a conflict erupted in the Yao, Tashan, and Ershan regions, with Quach Kai's forces being annihilated in the desert. Suffering from dehydration, he fell into a coma but was saved by the enemy. After the war, he was returned to his unit in a prisoner exchange. He then moved to Taiwan, where he and his descendants led prosperous lives, just as Yuan had predicted. After 1949, Yuan emigrated to Hong Kong, leaving behind several famous stories. Yuan also predicted the fate of Ma Lian Luang, one of the three grandmasters of Chinese opera during the Republic of China. Before leaving Hong Kong, Ma and his wife consulted Yuan, who told them, You, Ma Lian Luang, have another 15 years of good fortune. His wife, confused by the prediction, pressed for more details. What happens after 15 years? Ma, having an epiphany, stopped her inquiry, saying, Let's just be thankful for 15 good years. Indeed, 15 years after leaving Hong Kong for Beijing, Ma suddenly passed away, fulfilling Yuan's prediction to the day. Ma Lian Luang, a pioneer of the Ma school of opera, competed with Mei Lanfang. After the Cultural Revolution began, he was persecuted to death during the Haizhou abandoning the official position event. His family was robbed, he was imprisoned, and even their food was spit on by others. In late 1966, he died bearing injustices, exactly at 66 years old, admiring Wu Huan and Fuxi. Unlike Vai Thien Lai and Tu Duong Ngo, also considered among the three great astrological masters of the Republic of China, Yuan was not just a fortune teller but a free intellectual. His father had predicted Though lacking in the water element, you can supplement it with the water of time. Being foolish doesn't prevent one from accumulating small learnings into greatness. Though not famous, you won't lack moral virtue. If you can content yourself with studying and associating with educated friends, you won't fall into ruin and become a hungry ghost. Yuan, after becoming famous, frequently interacted with educated people. 
Scholar Lachan often praised Yuan's works on fate and physiognomy, comparing them to the artistic achievements of Du Fu, claiming no other fortune teller could achieve such. Yuan, indifferent to wealth, didn't accumulate riches. Despite his fame, he remained humble, considering himself ashamed of the worldly praise, only capable of supporting his family. He once planned to renovate the tomb of Sima Qian and the house of Yan Yuan, honoring their moral legacy while preserving national treasures. Yuan admired Wu Huan and Fuxi the most, one a saint who begged to fund schools, the other the progenitor of Chinese culture. His dream was to establish a school of compassion and a temple for Fuxi. With some savings, he followed Wu Huan's example in his hometown, using the family ancestral hall to start a school, named after the story Yuan and Sitting in Snow. During the Resistance War, as society and the economy declined, Yuan's School of Sitting in Snow reluctantly began charging tuition. Ashamed, Yuan specifically made a sign for the school, personally inscribing, not as good as Wu Huan. This shows Yuan was not just an ordinary fortune teller, he had his own virtues and passions. His son, Yuan Fu No, wanted to follow in his footsteps in fortune telling, but Yuan advised against it, saying, I have two areas of expertise, fortune telling and medicine. After I'm gone, destroy the fortune telling materials and continue my medical practice. Thus, Yuan Fu No stayed away from astrology, focusing on medicine. He went to study in Japan, continuing his father's work in promoting Chinese medicine and becoming a medical expert of his time. Yuan Xu San's views on the career of fortune telling and physiognomy were fair and objective. He believed that the art of divination could be considered one of China's national treasures, born alongside Chinese cultural history, originating in ancient times, highlighted during the Shang Dynasty, and flourishing today. 7. Tang Kwok Fian's Art of Face Reading So how can one understand others deeply? Tang Kwok Fian had a special method revered by many as the Art of Face Reading, summarized in just eight lines and forty words, Observe the eyes for truth and deceit, the lips for honesty. Success is seen in one's demeanor and ambition in their spirit. Lifespan is in the fingers, trials in the feet. Weakness and strength lie in their words, all within the speech. 1. Truth and Deceit in the Eyes Tang Kwok Fien believed that one's integrity or deceit could be glimpsed through their eyes and nose. If the eyes are shifty or the nose is off-center, it's likely that the person's intentions aren't straightforward. Lian Gu, a scholar from the late Ming and early Qing dynasty, also said, To know if someone is honest or deceitful, at least observe their eyes. The eyes are the windows to the soul. You can gauge a person's character by looking into their eyes. People who habitually glance around or avoid direct eye contact during conversations are often not sincere. 2. Honesty in the Lips To understand if someone is genuinely kind and honest, just notice the subtle changes in their lips. Since the mouth is a primary means of expression, those who speak calmly and truthfully are often seen as noble, loyal, and trustworthy. Conversely, those who speak ill or are deceitful should not be associated with. Similarly, people with fuller lips are usually seen as open, extroverted, and enthusiastic, while those with thin lips are often perceived as argumentative, proud, and arrogant. 3. Success in the Demeanor Tang Kwok Fien thought that a person's potential for success largely depends on their demeanor. Demeanor refers to the ability to stand out in a group of strangers, often becoming the focal point of attention. This is because a person with a strong presence commands respect, 
naturally gaining support and smoothly achieving success. 4. Prosperity in the Spirit Life has its ups and downs, and some people always seem downcast and troubled. Such individuals, often described as having a droopy demeanor, are unlikely to achieve great wealth. In contrast, prosperous people are always vibrant and positive, with a broad-minded outlook and healthy physique. Moreover, prosperity also depends on diligence and the drive for improvement. A hard-working and spirited person is more likely to build a successful career and attain wealth. 5. Conviction in the Hands Tang Kwok Fien said, A calm heart is seen in the palms with clear lines and shallow palms, whereas faint lines and disordered palms indicate a restless and unstable mind. A calm heart refers to inner conviction, remaining undisturbed and steady in challenging situations. Tang Kwok Fien also believed one's resolve could be seen in their fingers. Those with long fingers and robust palms are usually determined and confident, capable of foreseeing and planning, thus likely to achieve great things. 6. Life's Trials in the Feet Life's challenges are inevitable. Some may lead a smooth life with few troubles, while others face many hardships and obstacles. According to Tang Kwok Fien, to know if someone will face many challenges, look at their feet. People with strong, sturdy feet are physically resilient but tend to stir trouble for themselves due to their restlessness. 7. Values in Speech Strictly speaking, these lines are not considered part of face reading, but are deemed by Tang Kwok Fien as a crucial way to understand and assess people. To judge a person's values and clarity of thought, listen to how they express themselves. Those who speak concisely and to the point, focusing on the essence, show they are organized and principled. Conversely, incoherent speech and missing the point often indicate confused thinking and lack of organization. Insight The ancient saying, one's appearance reflects their heart, suggests that a person's appearance can reveal their character. Tang Kwok Fien's Art of Face Reading, although concise, covers various aspects like appearance, actions, and speech. These insights are not only useful in many ways, but also align with modern psychological theories. Hence, understanding these 40 words allows one to see through people effortlessly. 8. Confucius and the Pot of Rice Once, Confucius led his students on a journey from Lu to Kai. Among those who accompanied him were Yan Hui and Zi Lu, his beloved students. During the Eastern Zhou period, amidst constant warfare and hardship, Confucius and his students often went hungry and thirsty. Nevertheless, no one complained or lost heart. They all were determined to follow their teacher to the end. Luckily, on their first day in Qi, a wealthy man who had long admired Confucius offered them some rice. Confucius assigned Zi Lu to lead the students into the forest to gather vegetables, while Yan Hui was tasked with cooking the rice. Why did Confucius entrust Yan Hui, a disciple he held in high esteem and had great expectations for, with cooking? In times of hunger, assigning Yan Hui to the kitchen made the most sense. After Zi Lu and the students went off to gather vegetables, Yan Hui cooked rice in the kitchen while Confucius lay reading in an upper room directly across from the kitchen, separated by a small courtyard. While reading, Confucius suddenly heard a thud from the kitchen, stopped reading, and glanced down to see Yan Hui slowly lifting the lid, scooping some rice into his hand, and forming it into small balls. After, Yan Hui covered the pot again, looked around, and then slowly began to eat. Confucius, witnessing this, sighed deeply, looking up to the heavens, lamenting, Alas, my top student eating stealthily, betraying both his teacher and peers, how disgraceful! All my hopes for him gone in a puff of smoke. Later, 
Zi Lu and the other students returned with the vegetables. Yan Hui then cooked the vegetables. Confucius remained silently in agony. A while later, the vegetables were ready. Yan Hui and Zi Lu prepared the meal in the upper room. All the students invited Confucius to eat. Sitting up, Confucius said, Today, on our first day in Qi, how fortunate we are to have this meal. This first meal in Qi makes me miss my homeland of Lu. I am reminded of my parents, and so I want to offer a bowl of rice to them. Do you think I should? Except for Yan Hui, who stood silent, all other students agreed, Yes, teacher, you should. Confucius then asked, But is this pot of rice clean? All students, puzzled by what Confucius meant, looked at each other in confusion. At that moment, Yan Hui respectfully said, Teacher, this pot of rice is not clean. Confucius asked, Why? Yan Hui explained, When the rice was done, I opened the lid to check if it was cooked evenly. Unfortunately, a gust of wind blew in, carrying dust and debris from the roof into the pot, contaminating the rice. I quickly covered the pot, but it was too late. I scooped out the dirty layer of rice intending to throw it away, but then thought, Rice is scarce and we are many. If I discard this layer, it would mean less food for us. So I took it upon myself, with your and the others' forgiveness, to eat the dirty portion, leaving the clean rice for you and the others. Therefore, teacher, I have already eaten today. Now, I will just have vegetables. And, teacher, we should not offer rice that has been eaten to the ancestors. Hearing Yan Hui's explanation, Confucius looked up to the heavens and exclaimed, Oh, there are things in this world you can see with your own eyes and still not grasp the truth. Oh, I was nearly a fool. 9. Learning Above Looks Once Confucius was talking to his son, Ba Angu, and he said, the one thing that can keep a person deeply engrossed all day without getting bored is probably just learning. There are those who may not stand out in appearance, may not be very strong, and may not come from a wealthy background or have inherited riches to rely on. Yet, they can become famous around the world and be remembered for centuries all because they are educated. 10. Your appearance reflects your personality. In life, you'll notice this. Some people seem very refined at first glance, but the more you look, the more ordinary they seem. Others might look quite average initially, but as time goes by, you find their appearance more and more pleasing and interesting. This often happens because a person's face can reveal their personality, which in turn influences their looks. A person's character is written all over their face. Just like in Dream of the Red Chamber, Lin Dai Yu is described as delicate and melancholic, with her eyebrows lightly tinted, suggesting a frown without actually frowning. Her virtuous and fragile nature is compared to a blooming spring flower. Her intelligence and agility add to her graceful demeanor, giving her an ethereal beauty. Over time, personality can indeed alter one's appearance. There's an old saying, the face is molded by the mind, meaning a person's appearance changes with their thoughts and emotions. If you're generous, your face will naturally look serene. If you're friendly, your smile comes easily. If you're simple-hearted, your face will be as joyful as a child's. If you're deceitful, your eyes might look unsettled. A bold person's eyebrows might often furrow. A person's mental state, if positively transformed, enhances their vitality, strength, and confidence, not only improving their looks, but also enriching their aura. If you wish for lasting beauty, your soul must also be radiant, for only inner beauty can sustain outer elegance. 11. Your appearance reflects your life. We often say that judging a book by its cover is shallow, but sometimes there's truth in first impressions. 
This form isn't just about looks, but also includes facial expressions, eye contact, speech, gestures, and overall aura. A person's life quality can often be guessed from their appearance. There was a study about the correlation between salary and attractiveness, revealing that good-looking people usually earn about 15% more than the average person. This isn't just about being favored by bosses for good looks. Many attractive individuals possess numerous strengths. Behind every beautiful woman is often a more refined lifestyle. Selective eating, proper rest, regular reading, and consistent exercise. Your appearance is a reflection of your lifestyle. While natural beauty is a gift, presenting oneself as approachable and comfortable requires personal effort and care. We all have a responsibility to maintain our appearance. 12. Your appearance reflects your experiences. Someone once said, if God gives you a beautiful face, you must be careful, as it's a test of your character. If your character is mediocre, this mediocrity will show on your face and turn beauty into vulgarity. Many might have read the story of Miss Guo Yuendong, born into a prestigious family, but also experienced troubled times, worrying about daily meals and even working in a farm during her youth. Despite the hardships, she maintained her dignity and grace throughout. As she aged, Guo Yuen Duan remained a refined lady. The author Tran Dan Yen recalls meeting her. Her hair was like snow, wearing a sky-blue fur coat still very beautiful. At 86, dining out with three younger women, it felt more like three men accompanying a beauty to a restaurant, not three women with an elderly lady. This demeanor comes from those who've endured hardships, are tolerant of life's challenges, and have refined through years into a calm and elegant presence, shaping a lifetime's appearance. True beauty is not just superficial attractiveness. It's cultivated daily. Among a crowd, you can instantly recognize this quality. It's the embodiment of the soul. The British writer Russell said, a person's face is the outward value of that person. It not only conceals their life, but also the life they strive for. A person's appearance is not just related to their present, but also determines their future. But believe that appearance can change. Therefore, being kind, simple, optimistic, filled with love and gratitude, Enriching your soul and fostering a positive outlook will undoubtedly make someone increasingly beautiful.